Hi, everybody staying warm and dry today? We got pounded down in Stevens Point, so um, it's, uh, we have power outages and all sorts of stuff, but hopefully uh, you didn't have that up here. Um, so yeah, thanks for having me. It's, it's fun to come into en enemy territory and um, uh, discuss our shared past. There's, uh, like Cheryl said, there's, there's, uh, there's some stuff that's really unique between our, our, our two uh, main municipalities in our counties. Um, and, and I'm looking forward to, to diving into those today. So before we get into that, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what the Portage County Historical Society is all about and, and what we do as well as um, who I am. Um, and then we'll get into the main part of the program. If I can get it to work. You okay? Haha. <laughs> Okay, uh, so uh, the Portage County Historical Society, our mission is sharing the stories of Portage County, Wisconsin through education and preservation. Um, our vision to do that is providing connections to Portage County's diverse heritage. Um, we've been around since 1952, so we just celebrated 70 years uh, a year ago. We're almost 71, but we're still feeling pretty good about it. Um, and, uh, and we've built up quite the organization uh, since that time. Um, we have four historic site museums that uh, we operate, and when I speak with uh, Ben, I'm often jealous of the one facility here, because uh, ours are really spread out. I don't, has anybody been to any of our historic sites, as you see here? Oh my God, you gotta come, come down, it's, it's not that far. Um, and so uh, you see on the top left is the Rising Star Mill that's in Nelsonville, which is a tiny village um, near Amherst. Um, and that mill was built in 1868 by Jerome Nelson. He also got the town, or the village named after him. Um, and it's one of the few surviving mills in the state because those things are like tinder boxes. They tend to burn down. Um, so we're really lucky that we have that. But we have uh, several main events out there uh, every year. Um, over Memorial Day weekend, we have an art show out there. Um, and then this coming weekend, we have an open house as well as a Barnes of Portage County uh, photo exhibit. Um, so that's uh, next uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, and so that, that's, uh, that's one of the prettiest spots. It's right on the uh, Tomorrow River. Um, it's a big trout fishing spot. Um, is the top right is the Beth Israel Synagogue Museum. Stevens Point used to have a thriving Jewish population. And um, the, the uh, synagogue was built in 1905, and then we took possession of it in 1985. Um, and it tells the story of the Jewish population, Stevens Point. It's also where uh, one of our uh, like bookstore gift shops are as well. That is open this fall from 10 to 2 every Saturday. Um, and then um, I'm going to do actually Heritage Park last, but Firehouse Number 2 on the bottom right there, that's Stevens Point's oldest municipal building. It was built in 1885, um, and so there's just some general displays in there, and then we have um, it open in the summer uh, three times for what we call Firehouse Fridays, which is live music and a food truck, and then the museum's open as well. And then the crown jewel is in the bottom left, and that's Heritage Park, and that's in Plover, and that is 11 different historic structures that have been moved there from around the county. All but one is original to that site. Um, that's where my office is and we have an event there tonight actually which I'm going to talk about but we have a, a festival out there a Father's Day weekend that's called Heritage Days that is live music historical demonstrations um, all the buildings are open with with guided tours um, and this year we had 800 people show up to that oh we have a pig roast on Father's Day too so um, that also sold out um, we also do monthly history talks like the Marathon County Historical Society, um, as well as public tours and our school tours. We offer a wide range of different public tours. Um, you're gonna hear about this in a little bit because we talk about Point Brewery today as one of the shared connections. I'm the historian for the brewery. Somebody's gotta do it. <laughs> um, but uh, with that, when I came into this job, um, I had already written the book on the brewery and I said, well, instead of giving another presentation on the brewery, what if we gave the presentation as a tour through the brewery? And so you can take a historic tour of the brewery that all the proceeds go to uh, the Portage County Historical Society. Um, along those lines, we also do pub crawl tours that are very popular downtown Stevens Point. There's a few bars still. Um, as well as uh, we do general walking tours and there'll be, um, we have a couple other tours we do. One that's a really popular that's coming back um, that we're just gonna announce this week is we do uh, cemetery tours at Forest Cemetery in Stevens Point, which is where the, the, the people who the streets are named after for the most, and the buildings and stuff are. And then we do offer school programming. We are lucky enough to have a schoolhouse um, that was moved to Heritage Park. And so we do um, school programming in the spring for third and fourth graders. So we get about 600 kids through in, in two weeks and then we all need a nap. Um, 
Along those lines, we also at Heritage Park have uh, a fe our feature exhibit space. Our, our, uh, it's the Old Plover Methodist Church uh, is uh, there, and every two years we do a rotational exhibit. And in um, acknowledgement of the 50th anniversary of the legislation of Title IX, uh, we have a women's athletics exhibit that's going to be up still next summer. Um, and so that's been, that's been very successful. Um, getting people out to the park, and it's a unique part of history as well. Um, and and it's, it's a cool thing to see people uh, connect themselves to this, this period in time before women had equal opportunity in things like athletics. Um, to piggyback on that, we have an event tonight if you want to do more history stuff. Um, it's not totally historical, but uh, we are in conjunction with the exhibit uh, out on the lawn tonight. Um, we're showing a league of their own. So uh, you can come down and have a movie, it's free. Um, and then uh, we have a, our big fundraiser coming up on uh, Wednesday. I'd like to invite you to that, but it's sold out. Uh, but that's called uh, Loggers and Loggers, and that's a beer and food pairing dinner um, that is lumberjack themed. So we, we play off of our, our lumber history that we're gonna talk a little bit about today. Who am I? Uh, how did I get into this position? I'm the first paid staff member of the Portage County Historical Society, and I started in December of 2021. Uh, my bachelor's is from UWSP in communication, actually. I was a radio DJ for 10 years, um, and then ended up living back in Stevens Point, where I had gone to school and started my career at, and said, you know what, I think I'm ready for something else. So my wife and I moved down to Milwaukee for me to get my master's in history with an emphasis in public history. And in my preparation for going back to school, I was on the board of directors for the Portage County Historical Society. And I thought, you know, if I just know a little bit more about how to run something like this, I think I'd be able to make a difference. And so I uh, got a graduate certificate in nonprofit management while I was in graduate school as well. And then the stars aligned and my wife and I wanted to move back to the area and so um, I became the first ever <laughs> paid staff member that way. Uh, before that though I was uh, uh, I had a fellowship of the Milwaukee County Historical Society doing programming a lot like this. Um, it was during COVID so that was a really fun time to get your feet wet and figuring out how to do these things so um, uh, that was interesting and then after grad school for a little while I did collections and digitization at the Milwaukee County Historical Society and was lucky enough in 2019 I had an internship at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History which is where you see this younger person who uh, doesn't have any gray hair um, kneeling um, but uh, that's Washington DC yep so uh, it's, it's right on the National Mall um, and I w was with their beer historian it was really again very hard work, um, lots of fun. Thank God it happened in 2019 and not 2020. I wouldn't have had an internship, so really lucky there. Um, so that's me, but what we're gonna get into today is the connection between Stevens Point and Wausau, and I'm gonna work really hard on not disparaging your city today, but it just might happen. It's embedded in me, I'm a UWSP grad, I live in Stevens Point, um, and the county pays, or the people in that county, for the most part, pay my salary. So um, we have some really interesting, uh, when, when Cheryl called uh, to say, uh, would you wanna do this kind of swap, um, I said, you know, we don't talk enough about the connection between these two municipalities enough, um, that, that we're kind of have a, a very unique and shared past. Um, so the Ojibwe, Menominee, and Ho-Chunk people uh, plied the river in, in canoes, portaging at rapids near Stevens Point, um, at Mosinee, or Little Bull Falls, um, and at Wassa, Big Bull Falls. Um, and so this, you know, that those are the people who came before us. Um, and in 1836, the Menominee ceded a three-mile-wide swath of land, because we're going to talk about George Stevens. We'll go back to him in a second. That's George Stevens, in case you've never seen him. Um, but uh, this is, they, they uh, ceded a, a three mile wide swath of land on each side of the Wisconsin River to the United States, reaching all the way to Wausau. So this is all of the Menominee land sessions from 1817 to 1856. And you see up there, oh, maybe I do have a pointer, don't I? Oh, there we go. Uh, right there, Wausau is right around here, right? And then, or, and then uh, down here is Stevens Point. And so that land became, um, essentially open for business. It, it's referred to as the Treaty of the Cedars. It's also called the Lumberman's Treaty because all these lumber speculators came out to make money uh, in logging in the Wisconsin River. Um, so it was abundant with white pine forests of northern Wisconsin and uh, access to the Wisconsin River was also key for tra uh, transportation. George Stevens, 
this guy, was not the uh, first lumberman to see opportunity in what is known as the pinery. Uh, Stevens Point's known as the gateway to the pineries. Uh, that's what's on all the uh, city stuff today. Um, but um, he was the, one of the first to have a long lasting impact. So other people had came, he, it's not like he came and there was you know, nobody here. Um, so uh, George Stevens uh, was a, a businessman from Western New York. And while he did deal with some things in logging, he had other things uh, that um, he tried in business in, in, up in Western New York. Um, he did do lumber there too. Uh, he floated his logs down river to Pittsburgh and then to the Ohio River, then to, uh, over to Illinois where he sold them at St. Louis. Um, in St. Louis, he struck up uh, friendships with investors who were interested in the pines of northern Wisconsin. So another new contact there was a guy named Robert Wakeley, who is uh, seen with his wife Mary there on the right. Um, this is Historic Point Bass today is his land, uh, which is in Nakusa, so south of Wisconsin Rapids. Um, and that's a museum that's really interesting too. And so uh, he, he has this contact with Robert Wakeley, who had uh, built one of his first, first, the first taverns in the area as you do, um, and uh, near Nakusa, and then it was on what was called the Old Pinery Road between Fort Winnebago, which is now where Portage, Wisconsin is, um, and what is today Stevens Point. And so Wakeley has this land up there, and he knows that his land is going to become more profitable and more valuable if he gets more people to come up um, and invest in the area. And so he's regaling Stevens with uh, visions of towering pine forests stretching as far as the mind could imagine, unmatched water power in the rivers that are just ready to be harnessed to be able to process this wood and make money by sending it downriver. Um, so with this new opportunity beckoning, Stevens visited the upper Wisconsin for the first time in uh, 1838. And I think, yep. We're going to talk about this in just a second, in, uh, in 1838. And so uh, he gets there thinking that Wakeley is full of it, that, that this is not, not even possible. And he's very pleasantly surprised that this is basically virgin forest um, and perfect for logging operations with this river that's running right through it. Um, so he, he starts laying his plans. And in 1839, he brings his family from New York uh, to Belvedere, Illinois, before purchasing supplies to begin uh, building mills and dams at Big Bull Falls, so where we all are today. So the, the process of getting all the stuff up river was really arduous. Um, in the 1830s. Um, so first you had to get all, all of the supplies to Galena, Illinois. Then you'd have to get it uh, up the river to Wisconsin. You'd get to Portage. You'd portage everything over to the Wisconsin River. You'd be able to go as far as Wakeley's Tavern. And then there's these things that we now call the Wisconsin Rapids that are too hard to traverse to get from Wisconsin, basically Nakusa to Stevens Point. So from Wakeley's Tavern to Stevens Point in those days was about a three-day oxen trip. So that's a long time to be on the road. Um, um, and, uh, and so he knew that he had to do all these things to get this stage. So um, what he did was come to what we now know as Stevens Point. Um, it was first known as Stevens Landing after he, he did what we're going to talk about. This is Stevens Point right here. Is, so this is the square of downtown Stevens Point, but here is the actual like point in the river. And this is actually um, what it, is known as Moses Creek. It was called the Slough for a long time. For a long time, it was a garbage dump for the city, too. It was, it was been cleaned up quite a bit. But now it's been dug underground. Um, it was uh, it actually, Schmeekley Reserve as part of the university is where that creek rises again now. Um, I know, though, because I had my house on the north side of Stevens Point, that that creek is very much still under at any time it rained. Um, so, uh, but that's, that's where um, he found that there was a man named James Allen, who was a uh, mixed, a man of mixed Native American and white descent, um, who had uh, built a small shack to just store some stuff. And he, and uh, George Stevens knew that he needed to have a stopping point for storage um, there so that he could restage everything to put them on uh, boats, which were handmade canoes at that point, to get them up river uh, to uh, Little Bull Falls, Mosinee where then you did have a short portage before finally being able to get things up to Wausau. So this is a really complicated uh, series of things. And this is 1839, and this is the frontier, essentially. Um, so um, George Stevens arrived at, uh, again, this point in 1839, um, which essentially is the, you see how Main Street at that point runs right into the river. So it's at the foot of Main Street. Um, and 
Uh, without that staging ground, George Stevens could not have come up to Big Bull Falls and found the city of Wausau, so you're welcome. Um, so once he arrives um, in Wausau, uh, this is a map from 1874, so obviously things went pretty well. Um, but once he arrives in Wausau, we don't have like a great representation of what that looked like. Ben passed along this uh, hand-drawn map of what it looked like where uh, George Stevens' uh, mill operation was. Uh, but he began building a dam and a guard lock on what he described as, quote, the decidedly the best mill site I ever saw or heard of in the Union, and the timber much better than below, uh, above than below, and 30 miles of handsome river to float logs down in the timber in many places, standing on the bank, can be felled and rolled into the river without even using much of a team. So um, he built a sawmill at the west end of what is today Forest Street. I believe it's near Fern Island Park. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not from here, I love Wausau, but I, I'm, the geography questions are the ones that'll trip me up. Um, and with Stevens Landing as his storage point, um, he laid the groundwork for the lumber industry um, in north central Wisconsin. I do wanna go back to this real quick though. So Stevens Point's right there. White settlers were not the first people there. The Menominee people used this whole area, which was, uh, became the Piffner Lumber Company, which is where the park is on the river today. Um, that was a, a, you know, a home for the Menominee people. Um, and they actually called this part of the land Pasha Pekinen, which means land that juts out into the water. So it's been called a point for a long time, right? Um, so he's using uh, that, that point as his staging operations, but George Stevens has a really hard time be making his mill profitable. Being the first of something isn't always the best. The infrastructure's not in place. Um, he doesn't have necessarily buyers just wait, waiting to go that he thought he was going to. He ends up getting one load of lumber successfully downriver and milled and planed and all that stuff and out to market. You can go see that lumber because it's in Nauvoo, Illinois at Mormon leaders Joseph Smith's settlement. So it's at another historic site. So that's all George Stevens lumber. Um, so his mill is not profitable. Um, and he, um, that's the end, no. Um, but uh, in 1844, he sells his interest in the mill. Um, Stevens Point, though, is already well established. It's interesting that, that we got the name of Stevens Point because he barely spent two weeks there in his whole life. Um, had much more to do with the development of, of Wausau. Um, but uh, he sells interest in his mills in 1844, goes back down to Illinois, um, and uh, dies in Rockford, Illinois in 1866, and he's buried in Belvedere. Um, and that is his grave right there. And that was, a, for a long time, nobody had found his grave. We didn't have things like the internet, so it wasn't until the 1970s that a historian in our county named Malcolm Rosholt figured out where he was buried. But, but he gets a town named after him. Doesn't stop though, the connections. This is one of the friendlier connections between the two cities. The next few are, are a little uh, more contentious. <clears throat> and that has to do with, uh, the first is after you have a city and you have a couple of cities and uh, you, uh, then infrastructure starts to grow and, and population starts to grow and you wanna be able to move goods and people between these municipalities. And in 1854, <clears throat> excuse me, the voters of Marathon County approved a bond to fund a plank road from Wausau south to the Portage County line. There was already a plank road going up to Stevens Point and they thought, well, it'd be great if we could link these two communities together, wouldn't it? And then we could have you know, more commerce and, and, and relationship. Um, plank roads were basically ro roads with wood planks on them. They were the super highways of the day. They weren't just dirt and mud. Um, and and they, not that you could move quickly on them, but that, that did facilitate better travel. Um, so the, uh, the, the reason though uh, that they, so they stopped at the Portage County line and the reason that the plank road did not extend into Stevens Point where it would have connected with this other plank road is that Portage County refused to spend a cent of money on the road for whatever reason. My guess is it was a defensive uh, maneuver to say, nope, this is where the South gets to stop on their way up and why would they need to go any further north and if we give it to Wausau, they're just gonna give their money up there and they're gonna settle up there and we would rather not. So that's 1854 um, and there's no super highway between 
Stevens Point and Wausau. Fast forward 20 years to 1874 and the Wisconsin Valley Railroad, um, and you can see this is from the Wisconsin Historical Society. These are uh, ticket stubs from the uh, Wisconsin Valley uh, Railroad. Um, but they were looking to connect Wausau to the other cities in the southern part of the state. Again, it's good to be able to move things in and out of, of communities. But because of the drama about the Plank Road 20 years earlier, the decision was made to bypass Stevens Point. Um, and they ran the track through Junction City instead. This is going to come back to Hot Wassa, though. I'm just going to tell you. Um, so it was later revealed that the sum of uh, $25,000, and I'm going to have another, oh, no, okay. Um, it was, uh, that sum of uh, $25,000 had been given to the Wisconsin Valley Railroad by a number of large uh, businessmen from Wassa expressly on the condition that the railroad did not run through Stevens Point. So there was a bit of things going on behind the scenes. They seemed to fear that if the railroads uh, went through Stevens Point, some mysterious influence may happen preventing the building of that railroad all the way to Wausau. So they, they paid off the railroad company to go through Junction City. Now, why would they be worried about this 20 years later? I mean, you have kind of a different generation of people involved and things are changing, you know, um, in, in the country by the 1870s. It's not the 1850s anymore. Well, it turns out that uh, starting in 1852, the federal land office was in Stevens Point, and it's from these offices that mostly white, mostly male settlers signed legal documents to claim land. And of course, you would want the federal land office to be in your town, because it would get a lot more people into your town. Um, and so th through some political wrangling, uh, the land office was somehow moved to Wausau in 1872. Um, something that Stevens Point's leaders were not happy with. So this was likely, there was good reason to suspect that Stevens Point may retaliate when it came to the railroad after uh, Wausau, they thought, stole their land office. Again, that railroad stop is going to be a big thing in, in, a, in a couple of stories from now. Let's talk about beer, okay? It's Saturday. Um, so Wisconsin, of course, being a state defined by its brewing industry, uh, it's no surprise that Stevens Point have a small connection uh, through beer. Um, George Ruder um, was born in the Franconia region of Germany, that's near Nuremberg, in 1827, and he learned how to brew at his father's brewery there. Now, we don't know why, but in 1854, Ruder moves to Milwaukee. Maybe he was not the heir to his family's brewing fortune. Maybe he just wanted to get out of Germany. We're not sure. Um, but in 1854, he moves to Milwaukee, and he brews at the Oberman Brewing Company. And in those days, the Northwoods, like we've talked about with George Stevens, even still um, in, in you know, getting into the mid-1850s, is part of this wild frontier, but it's quickly growing. And citizens up north would take, or municipalities would take out uh, advertisements in the newspapers in the south asking people to come north to start businesses or professions saying, hey, we need these things. You could probably make some money if you came up here and started your life up here. Um, and so they needed things like school teachers, lawyers, clergy, and there's a lot of lumberjacks working in the pinery that are of European descent. They needed beer brewers. And so, uh, not sure if that's exactly how uh, George Ruder came north, but it's possible that he did see an advertisement like this or hear from a colleague that there was a possibility of opening a brewery um, in Stevens Point, and whatever the case may be, Ruder arrives in 1856 um, at the main plank road going into Stevens Point, only Stevens Point, um, at that point, uh, was called the Plank Road House. And here it is, this is a later picture when the brewery was under the management of Andrew Lutz and his brother uh, from the 1880s. But this is the Plank Road House, probably just the front portion at that point. And the way you want to think about this is kind of a, like an inn in the European tradition. So there's a place where you can get a hot meal and a beverage below, and there's some lodging up north. Because you would have been on the road for three days before that and needed a stopping off point before you came into town. And it still would have been, uh, you know, probably a, a, a few hours of a walk just to get into town at that point. So um, uh, he, he arrives at this Plank Road house, and next to the house, there's a brewery under construction. And so he says, you know what? This looks pretty good. I'm going to buy it. 
So he buys it, and he's joined by another German immigrant named Franz Valle. And on Christmas Day, 1857, the Wisconsin Pinery newspaper reports that Reuter and Wally's Brewery is uh, open for business. And so that's why the brewery says that their founding year is 1857, even though he kind of got there in 1856, but we don't know that they were brewing beer just yet. Um, Reuter doesn't stay in Stevens Point, though. Uh, in 1860, just three, four years after starting this brewery in Stevens Point, he moves north to Wasa to start his own brewery. And by 1870, Reuter's Brewery was one of the largest operations in northern Wisconsin, uh, producing 600 barrels per year. Uh, for a time, in 1871 and 72, Reuter leaves the brewery business to go into the lumber business, as you do up here. Um, but uh, he, and he sold, the, sold the operation to uh, two men. Apparently, business was not good under them, and there was some shady dealings going on. And so he bought the business back in 1872. And the central Wisconsin newspaper here in Wausau uh, reassured readers, the great beer trouble has ended. Mr. George Reuter is back in possession. So apparently, it did not go well for the two years he didn't own the brewery. Uh, Reuter was very... Uh, uh, minded about uh, expanding the brewery, wanted to uh, wanted to make more money and have a bigger impact on on the uh, economy. Um, so in 1881, he opens another brewery in Merrill under the operations of his sons, and this is the first case of a Wisconsin brewery building a new branch brewery and not just taking something else over that was existing. Um, so George sells the brewery in 1886 to his son um, Emil, and he re officially retires in 1887. Um, he dies in the 1890s. Um, this is actually not the brewery as he would have seen it. Um, this, in 1892, there was one of the biggest fires in Wausau's history that totally destroyed that brewery, and this is the second Reuter Brewing. Um, I believe these would have been on Grand Avenue. Um, I couldn't tell you exactly where, though. Um, but uh, uh, so the, the, that's the one you see here. Now, with wartime rationing um, in 1918 due to World War I, um, as well as prohibition is on the horizon. There's different wartime prohibition laws um, as well that make beer brewing harder to do. Um, Reuter merges with Mathy Brewing, which is literally right next door. So you see Reuter in the foreground and Mathy is, is just right next to it. Um, and so uh, their flagship product in the years following World War II is called Red Ribbon Beer. Um, but uh, the brewery, brewing industry after Prohibition, so Prohibition ends in uh, 1933, the brewing industry goes through probably the biggest challenge other than Prohibition where you can't brew beer, and that is that in 1933, there are 750 breweries still left in the United States. By 1973, 40 years later, there's only 65 breweries left. And so uh, Matthew Reuter is one of the casualties of this because the big breweries could undercut the smaller breweries on price. They're not making as much money. Their quality goes down. And by the time you realize it, it's out of business. So Matthew Reuter closes in 1955. Most of the brewery structures were torn down in the 60s and 70s. I don't know if anybody remembers those buildings. Yeah? That's too bad, right? They're pretty beautiful, right? Um, but uh, we still have our brewery in Stevens Point. Point Brewery survived. Um, so um, the only reason that, that Point Brewery didn't close was because in 1973, as they were probably months away from going out of business, um, there was a newspaper columnist from Chicago named Mike Royko, if you remember that name. He was a, a satirist and uh, a very opinionated man, uh, wrote a lot about the Chicago Mayor um, Daily. Um, but he wrote a column in 1973 that said that American beer these days tastes as if it was passed through a horse first. And the American people are really rational about these things. And no, they were really mad. And so they said, they, they were like, how dare you insult my Budweiser and my Schlitz and my Pabst? And this is ridiculous for you to say this. And this, you know, because identity, you know, people, a lot of people's identity are tied to the drinks that they drink, right? And so he said, fine, I'll put it to a test. And so Mike Royko in 1973, 50 years ago, uh, assembled the first modern taste test of beer in Chicago, where he got people from different socioeconomic backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds, different ages, and um, had them blind taste test any beer he could find. Now, the number one beer in the world is not Point. It's Wurzburger from Germany, which makes sense. The Germans are pretty good at drinking beer, right? That's where we get the tradition in, in the United States for the most part. Uh, and, but the number two beer in the world and the number one American beer was Point Special. 
And so suddenly, Point Special is really in demand, and the brewery is like, whoa, we were going to go out of business here in a couple months, so we're not ready for this. They had uh, TWA Airlines wanted 200 cases a week, um, and, and uh, distributorships as far away as Montana wanted uh, cases of, of Point Special. And, and they said, well, if we do that, the people of Stevens Point are not getting their beer, and they're the people who have supported us through all these tough times. And so uh, their slogan was, if you're out of Point, you're out of town. Um, and they made people come, and that was uh, like some people think of uh, New Glarus beer. When I go to Minnesota to see family, they're like, can you bring me some Spotted Cow? This was before that. Uh, this is a picture of Point using that to market their beer. This is the Portage County Fair in 1974 at what I imagine is 9 o'clock in the morning. And uh, look at that guy's suit. That's just something right there. But it was a huge boon to the uh, Point Brewery that saved the brewery and launched them, made them able to be put into the modern era of beer um, into the 90s and the 2000s. And now um, we came from 65 breweries in 1973. There are over 8,000 breweries in America right now. So it's been a talk about a resurgence um, of a business and, and the fact that uh, Point Brewery is one of the top five oldest breweries in the country. So right here in, in central Wisconsin. Let's get to something that's a little more contentious. That's uh, close to home for me. Um, as an alumni of UW-Stevens Point. Um, so the normal school system um, originated in the Eastern United States, um, but was established in Wisconsin in 1866. Normal schools were teaching colleges. Um, and the purpose of these institutions was to uphold the Wisconsin constitutional mandate that the state provide free public education and training of teachers to deliver that education. So Wisconsin's growing quickly, and so the need for teachers is also growing, and so five normal schools were created between 1866 and 1890. It's probably hard to see the words on here, but uh, basically you have Oshkosh, uh, River Falls, um, the main universities in Madison, but they had a teaching program, uh, Whitewater, um, and Platteville. I probably missed, did I count five? Well, there they are. Um, so um, th those are, that's the educational system. But if you notice, other than River Falls, which is in the way western part of the state, there's a northern hole that's not being served under this mission. And so in 1891, um, the legislature authorized the Board of Regents of the Normal Schools to establish a sixth school that was supposed to be in the northern part of the state, where one-third of the state's population was located and was just essentially unserved. Um, so the closest normal school to, to here at that point, or Stevens Point, would have been Oshkosh, which is not exactly close. Um, and so the two criteria that the legislature gave the Board of Regents was to consider the nearness and ease of which the new school could be reached by potential students. You want to be near a place that can actually have enrollment. Um, so John Phillips is right there, and I included two pictures just to show you that this guy had a variety of excellent facial hair. Um, but uh, he was the first member of the Board of Regents that was actually from Stevens Point. Um, he was a medical doctor in Stevens Point, and he served on the Board of Regents from 1876 to 1891, when the Board of Regents, um, when, when they made this decision that there should be a school in the northern part of the state. So uh, having a normal school in Stevens Point, uh, being on this Board of Regents for so long, was a longtime dream for Phillips. And the uh, legislature approved this new school Phillips moved quickly to see that the new school would be located in Stevens Point. However, the bill that authorized the Board of Regents to establish this new normal school was introduced by a guy named Neil Brown, who's from Wausau. And I'm, I actually would have questions if anybody would know what, because I was trying to find information on this, because so it says the legislation that required the new school must lay north of the 24th township. So there's some demarcating line, but I'm guessing that 24, well, what it is is it kept Stevens Point out. So this, the, he, he wrote this specifically so Stevens Point could not get the school. And Wausau is really the only population center, so ta-da, we get the school. That's what Neil Brown uh, said. So um, the uh, Stevens Point Journal called the move an injustice to those places south of the line and uh, called the move uh, dictate, dictated by an interested member of the legislature uh, from, quote, a small clearing on the Wisconsin River. So a committee of representative citizens from Stevens Point uh, goes down to Madison to the legislature to protest this apparent exclusion of Stevens Point. 
Um, and after much deliberation, they convinced Representative Brown to amend the bill, which eliminated that boundary clause and further provided for the establishment of then two nor uh, normal schools. And that was the compromise is, okay, well, we'll eliminate that, but now the northern part is, we're suddenly gonna give you two in the northern part of the state, how great. So many uh, cities put their hats in the ring. Um, very uh, competitive, uh, the cities include, from all over, Fort Howard, De Pere, West De Pere, Grand Rapids, Centralia, both those cities are now Wisconsin Rapids, um, Marshfield, Merrill, Nielsville, Chippewa Falls, Eau Claire, La Crosse, Sparta, Toma, Ashland, Roshburn, Bayfield, and Superior. So I know the end of the story, I hope you realize, is that Stevens Point gets the school. What school do you think was the other one, the other northern school? It wasn't lacrosse, it was Superior, actually. Yeah, so which is where I was born, isn't this great? I got out good in, in this whole deal. Uh, but of course, Stevens Point and Wausau both saw the site for the school and were the favorites. So Wausau contended in the Wausau Pilot Review that, quote, if any other city wanted the school, it would have to hustle to get it as Wausau was playing hard for first place. Wausau said uh, the, the newspaper, in the newspaper uh, that the, they better keep a watchful eye on the city of Wausau as it clearly outranks many of them in natural beauty and location and advanced municipal improvements. I'm not sure exactly what that means in 1891. Um, Stevens Point also began its campaign to secure the site. It was really important for the economy of Stevens Point to get this uh, school because it, it needed this other economic engine. The lumber in industry by the 1890s had declined in places like Stevens Point. Um, and there were multiple economic downturns from the eight, basically one a decade from the 1870s to the 1890s. In those days, they called them panics. That doesn't make you get really nervous, right? That's why they call it a recession nowadays, right? It sounds a little better than a panic or a depression. Um, but there was a huge panic of 1893, which is right around this time. And, and, that, and so uh, Stevens Point is seeing that they need to get some other industry in town. Um, so the Stevens Point Journal declared that the city, quote, wants that school and wants it bad. Um, and encouraged residents to think of themselves as a committee of one to do all they could do to secure it. It's, it's, the, it's a group effort to get, this, to get this school. So the case for Stevens Point, and this is 1891. This is right around the time um, that, uh, that this was all happening. Um, and so uh, Stevens Point City Council, seeing the possibility of this new economic driver in the community, proposes a special election for the city to issue, uh, to vote for the city issuing bonds in the amount of $16,000 to assist in the bid. Voters approved it. Doesn't always happen nowadays. Um, in addition, the city uh, resolved to donate a suitable site to the school, which I don't have it on here, but the site that they were gonna donate uh, originally belonged to a guy from Wausau. Um, and so in addition to the city resolving to do that, the county board for Portage County also appropriated $30,000 as a bonus towards securing the normal school. Now, I'm the one side of Portage County here and I'm not an expert on Marathon County history. So maybe the other presentation that we get is Wausau's side to this story uh, because I'm not sure exactly what Wausau did to try to get a school other than saying that it's so pretty here. Um, but the uh, strong community support went a long way in convincing the Board of Regents to choose Stevens Point. Uh, the judge uh, for Portage County also, his name was uh, G.W. Kate, um, he also sent a letter of support to the Regents about the general health and welfare of Stevens Point. Um, which is interesting because on October 18th, we have a free tour that goes on uh, called Murder on Main Street. Um, and Stevens Point was like, they had the nickname of Shooting Point around this time. So the general health and welfare, this, this is uh, some propaganda happening. Um, great place to live though. Um, but it had more, Kate also said that it had, uh, Stevens Point had more children in school than Wausau did, which would then benefit enrollment at the new institution because the people live right there. So the regents uh, narrow, officially narrow the sites to Stevens Point and Wausau, and in May of 1893, they set out to visit both cities. Uh, they go to Wausau, and they have a pretty good time. Um, and uh, Wausau's feeling optimistic about their chances, saying so in the newspaper, that I, I don't think we could have done anything else. I think, I think we got this in the bag. Uh, but the next stop is in Stevens Point. And remember how I talked about that the train had to get rerouted? because of the, they didn't, the Wisconsin Valley Railroad did not want Stevens Point to have a direct line. Well, that's 
going to come back to bite Wausau because the regents had to switch trains in Junction City. And Stevens Point had a specially furbished train car that the regents got on in Junction City that was top notch and rumor has it loaded with alcohol. And um, so uh, they, they get on this special train in Junction City, brings them into Stevens Point where they literally had rolled out the red carpet. Um, and so that's the depot in Junction City. Um, they put them up in the nicest hotel in town, which unfortunately we don't have a good picture of like being nice, because it's called the Curran House, which nowadays, anybody remember where Point Bakery was? Um, there's also a winery there now. It's basically that big street that kind of cuts the parks off from downtown now. Well, that wasn't there. Um, and this hotel would have stood right in the middle of that street there. Um, and in 1909, it burnt down. So that's the picture right, right after the fire. Um, but that's the, the most representative picture we have of it that's not just in the background or something like that. So they put him in this, the nicest hotel in town. Um, the next morning, carriages arrived to take the uh, regents to the potential school sites, as well as a tour of Stevens Point's manufacturing, uh, different businesses, education. Uh, they took them to the different railroad uh, centers. and. Um, they, uh, the city uh, was a pleasant surprise for the, the regents because apparently while they were in Wausau, uh, they had been talking trash about it up here. And so they thought they were coming down to this horrible city in, uh, you know, in Portage County, uh, when in fact they were like, well, this is actually pretty nice. So they set the bar low for us, which then helped Stevens Point. Um, so all that remained after that was the vote. So July 21st, 1893, the regents uh, met to decide the matter, and um, tension and rumors ran rampant through Stevens Point. The operator of the local telegraph office stayed at his post in, late into the evening until just after midnight when word came. So they got a telegraph from the Milwaukee operator that says, Stevens Point wins one school. Short time later, the local delegate from Madison, whose name was G.E. McDill, his family's got a pond named after it, um, but uh, he wired directly from Madison where he had been uh, a witness to the proceedings, saying to the boys at Stevens Point, we have won, the world is ours. Stevens Point wins on the 101st ballot, the, uh, and uh, this, the mood in Stevens Point then was pure jubilation. An, an estimated three to 5,000 people filled the streets, which is a big proportion of the, the city population at that time. They created huge bonfires in the middle of the public square, which is risky. Um, horns blew, people pounded on drums. Um, the real his uh, ooh, I didn't put him in there. Uh, but the real uh, hero of Stevens Point's victory was a guy named Byron B. Park, um, who served on the Normal School Board of Regents from 1892 to 1895. And using his influence, he helped persuade the other regents that Stevens Point was the, the, the best site. So kind of took Phillips' mantle after Phillips retired from the board. Um, so when Park got back to town, there was a massive public reception for him on the public square to honor him. Uh, not everybody was uh, happy with this decision, obviously. The Wausau uh, residents were not. The Pilot Review uh, wrote that the regents uh, <laughs> chose to locate the school in a city with a moral character which stinks worse than the Milwaukee River. Um, the Wausau Central wrote that the character of Stevens Point was so poor that it would be risky to even locate a penitentiary there. Um, alas, the normal school was built. Uh, that's right uh, around the time of completion. Um, in, and the first classes were in September of 1894. Um, so there's an anniversary coming up uh, next year. But uh, m mind you, uh, Wausau was still really unhappy with the decision. And as of 1895, uh, you know, full two years after this battle and a year after classes had already started, Wausau Central newspaper wrote, the normal school at Stevens Point is such a failure that the state is seriously thinking about uh, over that institution as an asylum for the feeble-minded, which would be a very good stroke of economy for those people. Um, so they weren't exactly high on uh, Stevens Point's normal school. Um, and through the years, the college, had, the school has changed names several times. Obviously, it was the normal school. And then in the 20s, it became Central State Teachers College, um, then Wisconsin State College, Stevens Point in the 1940s, Wisconsin State University in the 1960s, and finally in 1971, it uh, joined the UW system. It became UW-Stevens Point, and it's became a hub you know, for post-secondary education in the north central part of the state. But Wausau doesn't get totally left out. 
Um, so uh, Wausau did recover from their loss uh, in the battle for the normal school. Um, in 1902, uh, the Marathon County tra uh, Training School for Teachers opened, that's on the left there, uh, went on to become the Marathon County Normal School in 1933. It just took 40 years longer for Wausau to get their school. Um, and then the picture in the middle is the UW Center. Um, Marathon County opened the first new UW Center building in the state in 1960, and it's still part of the larger complex. Um, and now in the contrast to the uh, rivalries of these eras that have gone by, uh, the Wausau campus is now under the leadership of UW Stevens Point once again. So the Wausau Pilot Review and Wisconsin Central would probably not be very happy about that. That's my presentation about the connections between Wausau and Stevens Point. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, um, if I'll just jump in here to uh, say I have a uh, microphone, I will be coming around, and if you could speak into the microphone so that we can all hear. Um, and I guess I'll hold off uh, the rebuttal in, for the, the, the talk in, in Stevens Point in the future. So. Um, yeah. uh, were normal schools, my understanding, they often started as a two-year school? Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in your explaining that because yeah, because so it was I think a two my year. Mother, my mother, she was in Regina, Canada, and was sure. going to go to a normal school, but she never yeah. got to go. Yeah, so that's when it became Central State Teachers College in the 1920s. Is when it became a four-year school. Yeah, so it was mainly a two-year school up until that point. I'm not sure on that one. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure but about this, but I keep hearing stories that there was a big rivalry when the airport was built. That sounds like, a, yeah, I don't yeah, have any information but I don't on know that. that. But I don't know what they were trading one way I mean, or the other. I mean, it makes sense that they kind of built it in the middle, right? Well, yes, yeah. but it sounds like we, I don't know. I just wouldn't wondered if you knew what was going on at uh, that point. I'm not sure. My, what I, I mean... Logically, I would think that yes, there was both cities probably would like an airport. My guess, though, is that because of the the university at UWSP, but then also obviously you have a larger city in Wausau. They tried to split the difference. It's, I guess it's closer to Wausau, but yeah, that's, that's something to look into. I can speak to that airport Go thing for it. because my home farm, which is still owned part of a mile south of the airport, okay. was take part of it was taken by the airport, and my dad wanted to lynch Leroy Jonas, was on who was on the county board. Oh. <laughs> So, Wassa had an airport, Stevens Point had an airport, sure. I think both of them had North Central Fluid and, and Marshfield. Okay. So, they all wanted one, but the FAA said, get together guys, we're only going to fund one of them. Yeah. And so, you know, this seemed to be the logical thing. I heard that there, the other consideration was in the Dancy area, so that, you know, more Interesting. centrally located. Got it. Interesting. Thank you so for sharing So if I that. may ask you about the WASA Pilot and Review, we have an electronic paper like that. So this was actually a, a, a newspaper at the t time? Yeah. Is it the same one now? It's a continuation? It, no? No. It's, no. it's just okay. an electronic yeah. thing. But yeah. yeah. Well, I didn't know if they... they yeah. It was the... Yeah. So they probably... That's what they're hearkening back to. Yeah. yeah. So at the time, in the early years of the 20th century, there, were, there was the, the WASA record... Herald, and then there was also the the pilot. The pilot didn't last in. Uh, I think it went under in the 50s, maybe. Um, and so, when one to kind of take that heritage back, they they took the name and repurposed it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. <clears throat> There's a history of uh, tanneries in Stevens Point on okay. the river, and and Wassa didn't have that. But I was surprised that Stevens Point also had the lumbering. On the logging. Yeah, we but, had a lot of mills, right? The, the parkland that's now on the riverfront, that was all industrial land. That was all mills. Do you have any knowledge of the history of the tanneries? I don't, off the top of my head. Well, I can maybe speak to that. Yeah, right if here. Ben can, yeah. please. Um, well, we did actually have a, a tannery, pretty uh, big tannery. One, one of the things that tanneries work really well is because there's a lot of, you know, the white pine obviously was the, the big draw, uh, but there's also a lot of hemlock in the area, and hemlock bark is, is what you would make the, with the tanneries okay. um, that worked really well together. So sure. there, there was a, a pretty significant, it's just one of those side industries that pops up in both places. Well, I, I don't I know imagine. because you know, the, the lumber industry had declined significantly by the 1890s in Stevens Point. Is that the same up here? Lower, it would take because that, sort of, that because yeah. you know the the whole thing about lumber is the way they would do it is they would 
fall the logs and then you would drag them over onto the frozen river and in the spring rush them down to the mills and you know try to keep them from killing people um, kind of and um, but uh, they uh, uh, you know that that only works when you have lumber north of you, <laughs> right? right, or upriver from you. And so by that, by the 1890s, I'm guessing most of the lumber had run out in that part of the, the river. Well, the, of course, the, the railroad also helps with that sure. because now you can put railroad cars and you know, right. bring the lumber with that. Um, so I think Wassa might have stuck around a little bit more relevant in that industry just because we had the water power. Mm -hmm. um, it was just, they were actually bringing up trains of, sure. of logs from like, this American South, sure. uh, just to cut them here, because well, it's easier than replicating that sort of facility down. Well, and down from south. Stevens Point yeah. all the way south into Wood County, I mean that was all paper mill territory by you know by that point then too. So, sure, yeah. yeah. Uh, was there a uh, railroad line that uh, went kind of east of the uh, Mosney area, say about eight miles, and they uh, hauled the lumber that uh, was produced in that area back to the paper mills in Stevens Point. Professor Brett Barker. That was a Milwaukee road spur that went to Gunther, a place called Gunther, which I don't think there is a place much of a place called Gunther anymore, but it did run from Mosney East, and they even had a little turntable at the far end because turn train around and you can sort of almost see where it is sometimes when there's a little snow on the ground you can see the grade a little bit but there's not much left but i think that was owned by the milwaukee road there's a book about the milwaukee road valley line that talks about that i think the uh, uh my grandfather they homesteaded eight miles east of mosinee and um there is a the 40 next to their property is where that railroad hmm. line went. And for those of you who know where Sitko's Tavern is, east of Mosinee, eight miles on 153, if you go south a mile, uh, a mile to the T in the road, and then you continue to the east until you come to the Marathon County Leather camp, Camps, that's where that line crossed. Hmm. And that's approximately um, three quarters of a mile from what you would call Gunther. Makes sense. Anybody else? Okay. Well, um, I guess we'll we'll call it there. If you, you. join me in, in thanking John once again for thank you. Hey there. Um, little addendum to the video here. Um, I'm Ben Clark. I, I was, you heard my voice, albeit a little bit, um, I, got, I ended up getting sick over the last week, so bear with my, my croaky voice here. Um, you heard my voice in the program. I don't think you saw me too much in front of the camera, but um, I was doing the logistics. Um, I do a lot of the History Speaks, um, sort of the recording, editing. I'm in the process of editing it now, um, as well as doing some some programming myself, uh, along with Gary's History, Speak, or History Chats, uh, do talks like this all over the place as well, um, as well as being the archivist here. Um, we joked a little bit during the program. Uh, well, actually, first of all, big thanks to John for coming up. Um, again, um, very cool uh, that he was, you know, when we approached him about this, uh, Porch County, about maybe doing an exchange, he was like, absolutely, let's do this. Um, and, and we appreciate him coming up. Uh, hopefully, uh, he felt welcome, because um, you know, definitely was. Um, during the course of the program, though, and I think that John was, was maybe playing with the idea, the narrative idea of that, that rivalry a little bit. Uh, and maybe playing that up. Um, I don't think anything, you know, we, we joked a little bit at the end uh, of the program and a little after that, you know, like, okay, for, for the exchange part of this, when I go down to, to Portage County, I'll have to do my version of this. It'd be kind of interesting to see the other side of it. Um, ultimately, I don't know that that would be as interesting as the idea is more interesting in practice. Uh, and I, I, maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll do something completely different. Um, but the main thing is, I think that I want to make a point uh, to just add something here, an addendum, not as a rebuttal, because I don't think that too much of what he said was wrong. Uh, I don't think any of it was wrong, wrong. Uh, factually, I think everything was right on. I think the interpretation, um, there's some points that I quibbled with, um, the conclusions, because I think that there was more to the story than was, you know, he talked about, which is, which is understandable, and that's totally fine. Um, but I think, hey, it's our platform here. It's our program. I'm going to use my uh, uh, power here to just drop this in at the end. 
Um, again, I don't think too much of what he said was was wrong, uh, particularly like the you know the stuff with the the early history, um, you know the the creation of our communities, uh, the. The university stuff was really cool. I did not know very much of that. Uh, maybe I should have, but um, that was a really cool insight into some of the the story there. Um, I do also think, like the brewery stuff was awesome too. Of course, John is going to be very well knowledgeable about that, uh, given his background. Um, I do think that when it comes to the railroads and the roads, there's a little bit more context that I can add. And so I figured, eh, what the heck? If you're still watching, uh, let me let me add some of that. Um, so first of all, I want to, let me, let me pull up a map here. Ooh. Let's talk about the creation of the road, that first road, right? Um, in 1849, uh, by this point, uh, over the course of the year, uh, Columbia County gets split off from the rest of Portage County. Um, actually, you can see what it looked like uh, back in 1846 before statehood. This was all Crawford County. Um, and then by 1848, I think, around the time that we became a state, a little bit before, uh, Portage County extends all the way up the Wisconsin River. You can see the sort of green here, all the way to the line with Michigan. Still figuring out what that's going to be. Point is, from whether we're, we're here in 1846 or the 1840s, where we're just Columbia County, whether we are in Portage County, both Stevens Point and Wassa, or what, what is going to become, you know, Stevens Landing, I guess, and, and Big Bull Falls, we are very much in the same entity, right? And, and in 1850, we make the step of splitting off a new county. And part of the reason for that comes down to that road, right? We talked about the, John talked about the road that um, was a bit of a sore spot uh, for the folks up in Wassa. Um, the idea was Wassa uh, was pretty remote. Um, and actually I wanna bring, bring up here. So here's some context that John didn't include, uh, but I think is, is helpful. Um, this is a page from um, uh, the excellent uh, uh, Malcolm Rosholt's book, uh, Our County, Our Story, Portage County, Wisconsin. It's a great history of Portage County. So if you're if you're curious and you want you want a great sort of early history, uh, check him out. Uh, Malcolm is an amazing um, Malcolm Rosholt. I, it feels weird calling him Malcolm. Um, he, an amazing historian who wrote a lot about the, the general uh, central Wisconsin area, uh, the Wisconsin Valley history. So uh, uh, very much indebted to him for a lot of the work, uh, including this bit here. Anyway, um, in, in the chapter about the transportation and sort of the early movement in, uh, he talks about how, so let me put this here. In 1844, this is before Portage County exists, right? But uh, the commissioners, the transportation commissioners, uh, heard a petition from William Kennedy and others. Um, this William Kennedy was a, an early pioneer um, in in Wassa, um, and they were praying for a road from Winnebago Portage, Portage City, uh, down up to Big Bull Falls, or Wassa. So, hearing that, the commission decides to appoint John Dubay, James Harper, and James uh, John Blanchard as viewers to examine the country between Winnebago Portage and Big Bull Falls, specifically with reference to the most practical route for a road. They kind of come back and don't actually give suggestions for what could be done. Um, apparently, they just failed to view the road that they were told to do. So they in April, they created a new one uh, and said, yeah, they, you know, do it again, actually go up there. This time, John Dubé is, is brought back along with uh, Samuel uh, Merrill and William Tanner. Um, and they did go up there and they looked and their, the report was that in their opinion, the road was that now was now blazed uh, and traveled from Big Bull Falls as far as um, Hewton and Batterns at Plover Portage is as good and practical a route as any other that can be found the exception of a few places where it could be strengthened, uh, straightened and shortened a little. So until this happens, despite the desperate pleas from the people in the Bull Falls' uh, Mosini and Wassa uh, to really, we need, we, seriously, we need a better road. Like in 1849, 1850, uh, if you had to desperately get supplies from Wassa, it was like a three or four journey, day journey just to get to Stevens Point. That's not great. We really need a better road. But it's clear that Portage County as it exists here, you know, they have other priorities. 
Um, part of the reason is that, you know, that, that commission that came back, it's not that I'm saying that the road wouldn't be better. It's that it wouldn't be worth the effort to build in part, right? The one that they had was as good and like the step to actually build a better road as we would need it would be way too expensive. And yet we really needed the road. And so when, as a new county then, a Marathon County and Portage County later in the 1850s, negotiate to have a road built. And that's the road that eventually uh, we call in Wausau the South Line Road um, because it goes from Wausau down to the South Line of the county, except Portage County doesn't build the North Line Road. And so, ooh. A couple points, though, to, to note. Um, the road takes a lot longer to build than they budgeted. Way more expensive than they expected, um, in part because labor it was really hard to come by. There's not a lot of contractors that are willing to build the road. Uh, materials were expensive. It took longer. It was more arduous than they thought they was going to do. And they only went from, let me let me zoom in here. They only went from Big Bull Falls down to Little Bull Falls. This is what basically Highway 51, Grand Avenue down, or, or old Highway 51. Um, now, did it go a little further? Maybe not all the way to the South Line, though. But we call it the South Line out of spite, I think, because Portage County looked at this and went, yeah, we could probably do that. And then they looked at the actual cost and went, yeah, we're not going to do that. So on one hand, there is some context here for why this all happens. Um, on the other, you know, it's understandable. I think it's it stuck in the, in the craw. That's not a very Wisconsin expression. Uh, we remembered it up here in Portage, or Marathon County, though, right? And when it came to the railroads then, um, let me bring up another map here. Ooh. This is the map that eventually, this is from 1883, so this is after we get some railroads here. Uh, but a, a decade earlier, it would really have just been, in 1872, 73, it would have just been the yellow here. Um, and then by the mid-1870s, 1880, uh, 1870s, we had the, the orange line here. This is So in yellow, we have the Wisconsin, Wisconsin Central uh, Railroad, uh, which does go to Stevens Point, but does not go to Wausau. Um, and then in orange, we have the Wisconsin Valley Road, which goes up through Wisconsin Rapids, to Junction City, not Stevens Point, and then goes to Wausau. And this is the one that, that John mentioned, uh, some suggestions that perhaps remembering how uh, we had been treated by Portage County uh, about the road, uh, you know, 20 years earlier, uh, folks in Wausau supposedly kicked in a lot more extra money uh, to the railroad company than they expected uh, to ensure that Wausau uh, was the only main connection there, that Stevens Point did not get that road. And I think that there is some truth to that. I think that was there was those sort of, you know, we remember the slight that Portage County had put upon us for the road. I do also think that we're also, to say that Wassa is the reason that Stevens Point doesn't get this connection is also kind of giving a lot of agency to the local people which I don't think is entirely true. Like, this yellow line was supposed to come up here, but I don't think, from everything that I've seen, they're basically already planning on building west anyway. The goal was maybe to add a jut, and they did have a contract with Wassa in Marathon County to come to Wassa. Um, but the Wisconsin Central Railroad, uh, well, the, the contract that was negotiated was really not great. And I think that if it had gone straight, like, like Stevens Point, right, is the main hub for a lot of the lines going through here, Wasa was never going to be that. It was going to be kind of like you can see the Wisconsin, uh, or see this is the Milwaukee Lakeshore and Western Railroad in in green. Um, it's eventually going to keep building westward, but like it's just kind of a jut here to Wasa, right? To add them in, and maybe the amount of money that was expected to make the yellow go up that far, the Wisconsin Central, was just too much. Uh, it would have put us too heavily in debt, and people didn't see the value in that, um, and so we had to break that contract. So like. This is all to say that, like, the local people don't have any a, a whole lot of agency in how much money the railroad coming here is going to cost. We can negotiate, but ultimately they have the power in deciding where the railroad's going to go. And they're already coming up through Wisconsin, uh, uh, well, what's here, Grand Rapids, you know, Nakusa, Port Edwards, um, right? Nakusa should be, Centralia. Um, maybe they didn't want to go to Stevens Point. Maybe going this way around to Plover and then up was just, it was easier just to cut through here. They probably didn't need much convincing because they probably weren't intending to go to Stevens Point in the first place. Um, right? Railroads are going to do what they're going to do. Railroads are notoriously corrupt. Uh, they are not the most scrupulous business people. They are not local. 
So to give them the to give the agency over these decisions over, you know, the money that Wassa paid them to come to Wassa, yeah, there's a little extra to make sure. Like maybe that bribe was a thing. It I think it probably would be uh understandable if it did happen the way that this history hints it did. But also I don't think that they were the ones that that set that over the edge. I think it probably wasn't gonna go to Stevens Point in the first place. Um, I think the railroad company probably would have been happy to take another bribe equally sized from Stevens Point to actually go there. Whoops. But they didn't. And so there's, which is to say that I think, you know, with these things, whether it's the railroad, like, yes, Wausau's disappointed that the Wisconsin Central doesn't come here, but we're happy that it came to the area because boy, does it make it easier to get people in and out. Um, it's a bit of a sore spot that, you know, we didn't get that road from Stevens Point up, but also... Just building the road from Wassa down to Mozanie cut the travel from Wassa to Stevens Point from a three-day journey to a two-day journey. So, like, it's an improvement. And, like, when it comes to things like the university, I think that it's also worth noting that, like, you know, Wassa and Stevens Point obviously had very different ideas about who should get the university, the teaching school, but we both were very happy to have a teaching school come here. I think one of the, the primary things is, I think one of the difficulties that I had with, with John's program is it makes it seem like we are pitted against each other in a lot of ways. When I think that there is a much larger history of collaboration and cooperation between our communities, because in a lot of ways it like, you know, we might wonder who gets the railroad to come through, but it's a big fight to be able to get the railroad to come into this region at all. So in, in a way, we are competing with other regions as well, right? Um, and so there's a lot of con, you know collaboration and, and understanding there uh, between our two communities. Um, and the same thing with the university, right? Like, yeah, it's good. We want a university here. Uh, maybe at Stevens Point is not what people in Wausau were hoping for. Absolutely, we wanted it here. But like... At least it's not Madison that we have to go to. That's better, right? And we can always maybe get a, like a branch here. Um, you know, Neil Brown opened the door to have more than one his uh, 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 more than one um, university in in nor the northern part of Wisconsin. At some point there'll be three or four of them, and then maybe we can get one. We did, right? Um, so yeah, I just wanted to end end this by saying uh, again, there's some some quibbles, there's some some extra context that I'm adding. I hope that doesn't take away from the story that, that John uh, mentioned. Because again, I, I think all of the stuff that he talked about is is accurate. Um, and I might be even repeating some of the stuff that, you know, in spirit he was talking about, but just didn't phrase it in this way. Uh, so I apologize for being pedantic and going, ah, I got to have my last, you know, uh, line in here for this last uh, about 15 minutes here. That being said, again, I just want to say again, really appreciate John coming up. Um, I'll echo his sentiment that... Um, they have a lot of really cool stuff happening down in the Stevens Point area and, and in Portage County in general. Um, you know, support local history wherever you can. Um, if you're down in, in Point and get a chance to see, you know, their 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 Heritage Park, uh, you know, the exhibits and, and buildings there, please go do it. It's pretty cool. Um, and they're doing a great job there. Um, and again, lots of really cool stuff, programs uh, that they've been up getting up to down there as well. So um, awesome to see. Um, it's it's great to have John, um, you know, as as the director down there. Um, he's been doing some very cool stuff, as I can say, as 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 our neighbor, and also you know, I've worked with him, um, Wisconsin Council of Local History, and things like that. And and you know, I'm, we're we're glad to have you, John. Um, so big thanks to 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 him and and to the wider organization. Look forward to coming down and doing a program at some point next year, hopefully, um, for for their group too. Um, and again, you know. It's, it's cool to see these connections um, between our communities. So um, with that, I think I'll, I'll end it. Yeah, I'll end it. It's probably long enough. I'm already added another 15 minutes to the program. Thanks for watching. Uh, we have a lot of other cool programs um, that we've recorded from different people. Uh, if you're interested in learning some of the other communities around the area, uh, last year we had um, uh, Don Schnitzler from... Uh, yeah, Don, Don from uh, or Schnitz uh, from from Marshfield uh, from Northern Northwood County Historical Society. We'll probably do some other collaborations in the next year. I, I hope um, as well. A lot of other cool stuff, um, as well as more stuff always coming up. So if you got a chance, if you're if you're already here, yeah, take a look at the other videos and see if there's stuff that you might be interested in watching. Um, it was cool to share local history. Got to end in a plug, I guess. Thanks for watching. Um, and uh, again, thanks to John Harry for coming up um, and for uh, Porch County for the collaboration.